We're in a series called Money Matters, and that's why we had the testimony from Ellie. Good job, Ellie. And the uh, sermon bumper and this graphic and everything, and we kicked off the series uh, last, uh, last week. And if you miss any of them, they'll all be on our YouTube channel and our podcast. You can go to everynationgta.org for anything that we do. We try to make sure it's always available digitally online if you miss anything or you want to review something. Sermons, we also have study guides that go along with every one of the messages. They're available too. So here we go, week two in Money Matters. I have a friend in uh, town, really my best friend, and uh, we were at Starbucks the other day, and uh, uh, a student came in, an, an international student, and announced that this is his first time ever being at a Starbucks. And I go, wow, man, we were both taking notice of this. It's like... Really? I mean, first time at a Starbucks, that's amazing. And so I began to tell a story of, uh, to my friend the first time that I ever went to a Starbucks. And it was actually in Southern California in the Delamo Mall down in um, Torrance, California. And I can remember this was like maybe early 90s, I would say, just dating myself. And I remember I saw this thing called Starbucks. I didn't know what it was. It was just like this sing- symbol. It just had Starbucks and so we went in there and we realized, oh, it's a, it's a new coffee shop. And so we went in and grabbed a couple of coffees and I tasted this and it was just so strong and I hated it. And I turned to my wife and I said, this coffee shop will never catch on. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's something about the future that we just can't predict. Um... This last, on a more serious note, this last year, we've had uh, a lot of friends and ministry colleagues pass away. Uh, Pastor Ferdy, for those of you who know, who are from uh, Victory Manila, uh, a year ago when we were at our big conference in South Africa, I had invited him to come in 2024 and preach here at Every Nation GTA. And we had the arrangements, the flights were booked, we were all set, and he was going to be with us in early June and teach about discipleship and evangelism as well. And then we got the word that still in his 50s, he's died of a sudden heart attack. And, um, you know, then there was another pastor a week later, our lead pastor in Kuala Lumpur, died of a heart attack, both men in their 50s like six days apart. And um, then our dear, dear friend, we mentioned this, uh, we we started the original Every Nation Church back in Calgary. U Church, it's called. It's one of our uh, uh, member churches. And our dear friend, you know, our other really dear friends that we turned the church over to, Jen suddenly got a uh, a really freak... um, uh, strep too invasive something I'm not a medical person you, you doctors or medical people would know and, and, and contracted and within a couple of days died and um, I'm just thinking like and there's, there's so for, for, and then this summer my dear mother died in uh, July uh, she was 97 though she was waiting to go she said Lord any time now <laughs> and uh, she had two wishes so one is to live in the family home which was bought in 1957. It's the only house I knew. Uh, and that the Lord would take her quickly. And both of those things happened. So, I mean, that's just like my mom, you know. If you ever are concerned, a praying mom will get her prayers answered, it seems. So, but why am I telling you all of this? It's because life is short. We don't know what's going to happen. Not only can we not predict the next winning coffee shop or stock or anything else, but life in general. And one of the things that I heard over and over was this phrase, going to these funerals, was this phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Over and over I would hear this phrase uh, talking about people after they pass that they're sure they're going to hear the Lord say, well done, good and faithful servant. And it just sort of started ringing in my ears this phrase and thinking about it. And then I thought, hmm, where, where is that in the Bible anyhow? Well, the text of where this is taken f- from 
is what we're going to read and look at today. And it's actually the words of Jesus recorded in Matthew 25. And I'm going to read to you. We won't have all the words on the screen like we normally do. But I'm going to read you the parable of where this phrase, well done, good and faithful servant, comes from. We don't normally do this, but I'm going to do something different. For the reading of God's word, can everybody stand? Some of our churches in every nation do that, do this. So for those of you who just walked in, you don't have to sit down. Um, okay, here we go. Matthew 25, starting in verse 14. Then a man who had come... Ooh, I went ahead too much here. Again, the kingdom of God will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five gold bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five more bags. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. And I have gained two more. His master replied, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. The master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have, will be taken from them. And throw that worthy servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. May the Lord bless the reading and proclamation of his word. You may be seated. So this passage is what Christians would commonly know have as stewardship. It's the classic passage, there's, a, there's another one in Luke, on stewardship. Um, and it's all about how the kingdom of God is going to advance in the earth. You know, we pray, even if you don't know much about Christianity, you probably have heard the Lord's Prayer where it says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Like, that's the point is that God's kingdom would come and flourish in the, the, the world. And Jesus, in this passage, actually told four stories about what the kingdom was like. This was just one of four. I'm not going to go on the other three. But he was talking about how the kingdom advances. Uh, just before this, there was a parable of the ten virgins, who uh, the point of that one is to always be ready. Anyway, I can't preach all four uh, parables. I, can just, I want to stick to this one. But it's been underscored. But this one is about the kingdom advancing through what's called stewardship. Now, the word stewardship isn't in the Bible a lot. It is, there's there's several, there's a few verses where the word is used stewardship. But the concept of stewardship is all throughout 
uh, the Bible. Um, we see this. And it's, it, it was interesting when I was studying for this that the word stewardship actually comes from the Greek word okionomos. Okionomos. And as I was looking that up, um, okios means a household or a house. Nomos means rule or law, and if you put them together, you get the rule of the house. In fact, okeonomis is where we get the English word economy. Economy, okeonomis, the rule of the house. And so you can wax eloquent at work, and you can say, how was the, have you been checking the okeonomis, otherwise known as economy, this day, these days, anyway, whatever. Um, so what is God's house? God declares that everything is his. In fact, uh, Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everyone in it, the world and all it contains. So God's house is everything, the cosmos, the universe, the earth, you, I, everything. That's his house. And so the question then is how to be a good steward. How to one day hear in our own lives, well done, good and faithful servant that you have been a good steward. You have been uh, good at following the rules of God's house. So here's some things about a steward. First of all, the steward uh, does not own what he manages. You notice that he gave the 10 bags of gold, but that, those bags of gold were actually given to the people, but, to the people to manage, but it wasn't theirs. Uh, however, the steward does have authority to make decisions on behalf of the owner. When the owner actually gave that, uh, he wasn't sending back orders, okay, do this and do that. He, he fully entrusted the steward uh, to be wise with that money, which is the next point. The chief responsibility of the steward is to wisely allocate the limited resources. And I know there's some people in our church who are managers and they're project managers, and your job under your company or with the resources that have been put in front of you, the teams, the finances, the budgets, and all of that, is to take those limited resources, right, and be faithful with them and do the best you can with what has been entrusted to you. That's the job of a manager or a steward. But here's the thing. What's interesting is that this stewardship parable, because it, 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 it's all-encompassing, as I said, starts with an illustration about money and about bags of gold. And the first thing that God tests us in our stewardship is what we do with the money that he has entrusted to us. And just to back that up, I'm going to tell you how much the Bible has to say about money. 17 of the 38 parables of Christ are on money and possessions. Uh, this topic is mentioned in Scripture more than any other, three times more than love, seven times more than prayer, eight times more than faith or belief. In fact, as Pastor Richard uh, mentioned last week, over 2,000 verses, just to be a bit more technical, 2,172 verses deal with money and possessions. So stewardship with the money that God has entrusted us actually begins what we teach here at our church, which is just something called tithing. The first tithe, which is giving 10% of your increase or your income to God, was first given to Abraham 500 years before the law of tithing was given uh, to Moses. And then he passed it on to his sons, Isaac and Jacob, and they did the same thing. There was no law. They just had a relationship with God. How many know that God has always been speaking to his people, his children? Whether there was a written word or not, God is speaking. That's why I don't, my job as a pastor and our job in what we call evangelism is actually not to tell them, you know, people out there all, our job is to join the conversation that the Holy Spirit's already having with another person. Because God is working on every soul and every heart in various ways that we can't even understand. So let me um, give you the very, the, here's a, a passage real quick of the very first tithe that was given. And Melchizedek, I can't give you the background because I've got too much other stuff and we don't want to be here all day. 
And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, or now Abraham, by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the God Most High who has delivered your enemies into his hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. So that was the first time in the Bible. And if you were ever to study theology or whatever, you would always uh, study something called the law of first mention. It's like whenever you're studying a doctrine or a belief, you always go back and say, where was the first one mentioned? And then you build from there. And this was the first time it was. But now I want to go, and for some of you, this passage might be new, but for some of you who have been in church in a while, this is the classic tithing uh, passage from the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Jewish scriptures or the Old Testament. So here it is. Uh, I'm going to read this uh, out of Malachi. I, the Lord, do not change. The descendants of Jacob are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from me turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. This is God speaking to his people. Return to me and I'll return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? And God says, well, a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me. So the nation of Israel are quite confused by this, uh, by this word from God. But you ask, how are we robbing you? This is not making any sense. And God responds in tithes and offerings. You're under a curse, the whole nation, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the sovereign almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing there will not be room to, uh, to store it. And I'll prevent the pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it's ripe, says the Lord almighty. And then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Some pretty strong stuff here, and a lot of pastors shy away from preaching uh, you know, texts like this and things, but here's what I just say. I never wrote this. I, I didn't write this, so there's no sense getting mad at me. Uh, God wrote it. It's in the Holy Word. And there's some strong stuff here, like robbing God. I mean, just, just think about it. I mean, how many of you, like if you're in a condo and say you notice your neighbor didn't shut his door all the way, would you like go in and steal stuff from him? I hope nobody in this church would. Uh, you know, or, you know, you had an opportunity to steal or to rob, you know. Uh, I hope you wouldn't do it. Yet, Christians systematically rob God every Sunday. Um, serial robbers. And then the other part that's tough on this uh, piece is that the part like you're cursed with a curse. You, maybe you haven't analyzed this verse like pastors have. You've analyzed it and reanalyzed it and looked at it and you know, sliced and diced it a million different times. And one of the things I'm like, that's strong. You're cursed with a curse. I was meditating on that and I realized something. Uh, it's not like if you don't tithe, you're cursed in that sense. From the fall of man, God said since our great, 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 great grandparents Adam and Eve turned away from God, God pronounced a curse on the ground. He, he pronounced a curse. It's going to be hard. Work's going to be difficult. You are cursed. The opportunity here that God is saying, would you like to come out from under that curse? Put your faith and trust in me. Take a step and do this obediently, and you can come out from under the curse. God was just pr- pronouncing what happens because of the fall of man, because of the curse, and is actually giving us some good news here. I've got a way out for you. So the tithe goes into the storehouse, which is the local church. The tithe is not just giving 10% to God, but it's giving the first tenth. Giving the first fruits, giving the first tenth is risky, and it takes faith. If I spend, you know, pay all my bills and everything, and I have 10% left, and I give it to the Lord, and I give it to the church, put it in the storehouse, there was really no faith in that, was there? Because it was the, you know, I calculated it out, whatever was left, I figured it out. 
And I'm not saying you shouldn't budget. But the first fruits, in, in, in when the tithe was first put into the book of Moses, into the law, it was an agri- agricultural-based society. And if you gave the first fruit, you never knew if the rest of the crop was going to come in, so it was extra risky. And God's saying, exactly. I want you to trust me. I want you to trust me. And that's what you see also throughout the Bible in the life of Jesus. You know, come and wa- out and walk on the water. You give them something to need. Like, I don't know, God's into faith. God's into wanting us to have faith in him because he's, as we, sang, we sung, sing sometimes, because he's a good, good father. His nature is to help us and to look after us. Proverbs 3, 9 says, Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your increase. Look at that word, honor and first. When you and I get paid, whatever we pay first is what we honor first. So if when I get paid, I pay my visa bill first, I honor visa first. Or maybe there's something else. Maybe they're saying, well, you know, I've got to you know, support my family. Well, then you honor your family first. But whatever you honor first means that Jesus isn't first. Make no mistake about it. Whatever you honor first is first. And God wants us to honor. And, and here's the thing. Uh, There's more to it, and we're going to get into it. There's bigger things of stewardship than stewardship of money. Even though we're calling this Money Matters, I'm going to shift gears in a bit into part two of this message and talk about a greater stewardship or a more full stewardship that God has for each and every one of us. So here's a question that I sometimes get, not a lot, but uh, this question, it's this, isn't tithing just for the Old Testament? And now we're in the New Testament. Well, there's a place where Jesus could have like really solved this once and for all. And it was when he was talking about to the religious leaders who were hypocrites in his days. And here's what he said in Matthew 20, 23. Woe to you, teachers of the law, Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, your mint, your dill, your cumin. I don't know how they are able to you know, count out 10% of that, but whatever. Um, but you have neglected the more important matters of law, justice, and mercy. You should have practiced the later without neglecting the former. If he was saying that tithing is done away with, he should have said, you should have done the later, but tithing, now that I have come, is over. It would have been perfect, but he didn't do that. He actually affirmed the tithing. Keep doing it. It's not all that we're supposed to do. There's something greater than tithing. Justice, mercy, faithfulness, they're greater than tithing. But it doesn't mean that this other, this, the former, is not important. Um, we have these discipleship materials, you know, we have some called the Purple Book, you know, the foundations, you know, and if you are a newer believer, it's really good to go through the foundations of the faith. Well, way back 2,000 years, almost 2,000 years, the very first followers of Jesus, the primitive church, had a, like a foundations book. It was called the Didache which you see the word disciple in it. And there was a theologian who, I I love this quote, talking about the early church that was written way back, not in the scripture, but in this other book, this other ancient manual called the Didache. And this is what theologian R.C. Sproul said. In the Didache, written at the end of the first century, or early second, there's a significant amount of material on the question of supporting the work of the kingdom. The tithe principle is clearly communicated in this work, showing us that the primitive Christian community continued the practice of the tithe. Amazing, isn't it? Um, So, as I said, there's more to God God entrust to us than money and possessions, but stewardship does start with money, according to the Bible. In fact, here's another verse, what Jesus said about money. He said this, whoever can be trusted with a very little... So I wonder what this very little is. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? 
So in Jesus' mind, honoring him with your money is a very little thing. We think it's a very big thing, honestly. In our society, in our culture, money's a big thing. It's, it, it, it's huge. But in Jesus' economy, it's actually not the most important thing. There's things that are way more important, and he tests us with what we do with something little as money. So what are the greater things that God wants us to steward? So if we're faithful, if we're faithful in following Jesus with the steps that he asks us to take, how far can that go? See, a lot of people think that this is some sort of downer thing, but it's not. Notice that the goal in the, in the passage was that he will have an abundance. You see that re- reiterated. He will have an abundance. He will have an abundance. The people, as they invest what was given, they will have an abundance. Increase is what God is into. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. That's what God wants. That's what he wants for you. That's what he wants for me. But he does it through trust. He does it through steps of faith. Here's a, here's a scripture that actually uses the word steward, stewardship, and it's 1 Peter 4.10. It says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. When I look at this room, I see amazing people. Each gifted. Each one gifted. And sometimes we don't see a gift or we think, oh, well, I don't have this and I don't have that, so I can't make an impact uh, with my life. Uh, Friday night, uh, I was out in the front porch just fixing a light and uh, the rest of the family wanted to watch a movie, and they were, call, hey, come and join the movie. And I'm like, no, I've got to fix this light. And they go, Dad, it's a documentary. I just left the, 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 the ladder right in there. They, they, know, they know that like I can be hooked on a documentary, especially music documentaries. But anyway, this wasn't a music documentary. It, it was, it was um, I wrote it down here because I forget, the, uh, the Remarkable Life of Evelyn. The Remarkable Life of Evil. And everybody, anybody ever heard of this movie? It's on Netflix. You must see it. Well, no, I don't endorse movies from the pulpit. Uh, <laughs> but if I did, <laughs> and uh, a guy who you know, had a debilitating condition that uh, he wound up in a wheelchair and all he could do is use his fingers and basically play role-playing video games. And through that, unbeknownst to his parents, made an amazing impact with his special gift. And so, if you want a tearjerker <laughs> warning, you can look that up. And then I was thinking about, you know, sometimes we all have those doubts, though, don't we? About, like, is my life significant? I thought by now I would be here and I'm only here. I thought, you know, I would be making a bigger impact. I think, am I the only one who sometimes thinks that way? <laughs> Okay, I, uh, I got to go back to my therapist if that's true. Um, <laughs> I know I've been a pastor long enough and I've had enough counseling sessions of my own to know that from time to time we all feel that way. We do. I thought I'd be further along. I thought this or I thought this with my life. I, I, you know, and we can, uh, we can have that uh, mindset. But God has put a special gift in each and every one of us. Each and every one of us. And that's why in a church body, it's really important that we encourage one another. And it's, it's, and, and it's, not, it's not just working in the church. We want you to serve in the church. Don't get me wrong. So don't quit serving if you're serving in the church. But it's not like when you pray and ask God, Lord Jesus, what is the purpose of my life? And he doesn't go, You're called to be an usher. (laughs) You're called to set up the sound system. No, that's great, and we want to keep doing that, right? So I don't want to lose all my servant teams, okay? So please, I need you to serve. We all need you. But there's, there's, there's other things. There's other things. 
if God has put music in you, you're going to be accountable to do the best you can with that, Jacob Moon. Um, if, you, if you are good at engineering and math and those sorts of things, you're responsible to develop that gift. I was just uh, visiting one of our students at OCAD, uh, Ontario College for Art and Design University, and he was taking me around, and just the, the art and the creativity in that place is just unbelievable. These people preparing to bless the world uh, with their art in all the different medias and form. And if you're one of those people, that gift must be developed, must be stewarded. That's, your, that's part of your five bags of gold. It's part of it. It's part of your five bags is to take that and to develop it. But you know, sometimes, and this is another, the, the another side of kind of getting older and just seeing how things work a little clearer, that there's also derailers. We were driving to church today, and I didn't have a chance to enter this in, but I asked Wayne, because there was this uh, rail truck, and it, and it says, um, rail track uh, detection unit or something. And what this thing does is it goes up and down the rails and make sure that there isn't something that's going to derail the train. Because it only takes a little thing to derail a big train. Um, so they have to go out with these special machines and make sure that nothing is going to derail the train. Well, in the same way, I've seen that there are derailers to developing the gift that God has given. There's derailers. The first one is right in our text, right in our text that we read today. Wrong view of God our Father. Notice that. Notice this, that the, the, the one who buried the talent Notice his view of the master who, who symbolizes God in it. You're harsh. What? You're, you're harsh. You, 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 you reap where you don't sow. You never, know, you never know when you're in trouble. God's not that way. You know, that's why he's so clear. This is what I love. This is what I hate. Now, earthly fathers, I'm one, we have four kids, sometimes I don't do so good at that. Sometimes I'm not like the good, good father. But he's not that, but it's a derailer. The guy said he was afraid. Why? Wrong view of God, that's why. Somehow, if he invested his one bag of gold, and here's the thing, God's the one who decides to give five, three, and one. He's the one according to their ability. But here's the thing. Uh, some passages of the Bible actually call it the parable of the talents. If you look back into other versions of the Bible, you will know this story is the parable of the talents. To one he gave ten talents, to one he gave five talents. Talents doesn't mean talented in art. Talent was a measure of currency in the early days. So you know how you have $5 bills, $10 bills, and $100 bills. Talent was a very high level and I was researching it, it's always hard to convert ancient currency to modern days. Um, but uh, it did say that in general, one talent was what the common person's wage would be for 20 years. So it's a lot of money. So you can, if you want to just convert it, you know, what do you make in 20 years? So even the one who had the one talent, it was still lots. And so that was um, not realizing that God had sown. He said, he said that you reap where you don't sow. Well, what about the one bag of gold? He did sow, and could it come for a reaping? So that's, that's one thing. God's harsh. He's not a good father. That's one thing that can derail this whole thing. Second one. Offense and bitterness. I don't see it in this particular scripture coming out, but there's lots of other Bible verses on it. And by experience, I see so many people who have been derailed in their faith over offense and bitterness. Uh, I like to tell people oh, you know, who are, have difficulty, like I've been hurt by the church, take a number. Take a number 
Um, there's no hurt like church hurt. And, but here's the thing. We're called to forgiveness. We're just called to forgiveness. He who's been forgiven much will love much. And uh, it, one of the saddest things for me is um, just brothers and sisters that were part of coming to the Lord when I came to the Lord as a student at UBC in Vancouver who we were going to change the world together. And some of us are still doing that and we're together. Like my friend Greg Mitchell who's the pastor of Every Nation Vancouver, we're still doing it. But how many people even deconstructing their faith and one of the main things was they got offended. They got offended and couldn't get over the offense. Okay, last derailer. Uh, and I, I touched on it already, but it's not honoring your gift in comparison. And so it's really that thing of really saying, I do have something from God. And if, there isn't, if there's only one thing that I would really prophetically want you to hear today other than all the other points I did, <laughs> was God loves you. He's put gifts within you. He's for you, and he wants you to be fruitful and to increase and to be his amazing sons and daughters. That's it. And so even when he asks us to do things that take a lot of faith and trust, it's because he wants to bless us. He really, really does. Well, at the time of Jesus dying on the cross, we're going to take communion in just a moment. If there was anyone who lived a life that was amazing, it was Jesus, the Son of God. He came humbly as a servant to walk this earth. He showed us how to live. He um, didn't get offended when people were spitting on him, flogging him, doing all, all kinds of things. If there was anything, anyone who at the end of his life should have heard, well done, good and faithful servant, it was him. But you know what? Here's what we do know, unfortunately, for him, but fortunately for us. As the Bible says that he became sin for us who knew no sin so that we bec could become his righteousness. And the Son of Man, when he was waiting to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, God looked at him after he took the sin on us and the loving father turned his head, his face away. I believe that what he was receiving was the one talent person's reward. Depart from me, you lazy and wicked servant. This is what it said was pretty much Jesus' last words on the cross. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And for the first time, for the first time, the Father turned his face away from the Son. The first time. In fact, and it's the only time that Jesus never referred to God the Father as Father and he referred to him as God. That is pure love. That is pure love. And so, when I think about my own life, I think when I see that, 
when I feel that, when I sense that, do you know what it does for me? I want to be faithful with my money. Honestly. If he loves me that much, Jesus, forget about 10%. You deserve it all. I remember being impacted as a young student at UBC and they, they told me that, hey, you know, one of the steps is I've read in the Bible to, to give 10%. I thought, I thought I had to give 100%. <laughs> oh, no, no, you get to keep 90 and, 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 and be faithful with those other 90, but God might want some of that sometime too. Okay, okay. Uh, and it's what motivates me to forgive those who have wronged me. I could be fouled out of the game. Most pastors do not retire as pastors. They're too hurt. I think it's like between, tw- I think about 20% of pastors in the ministry retire a pastor. It's a very dangerous job. And it's also what motivates me from de- to developing the gifts that I've been given. Instead of saying, I don't have the gifts like, all of you guys here who are so gifted, I want to develop whatever. If I'm a one-talent guy, a one-bag-of-gold guy, then I want to do the best I can with that one bag. And if I'm called to persevere and keep going at this and that's my job, then that's what I'm going to keep doing. I'm just going to keep going for Jesus. And that's what motivates me to follow the call of God in my life when life gets really hard. And the last... Many years since we came back from the U.S. and back into Canada, you know, it's been the hardest season of our life. But when I see what Jesus did on the cross for me, it motivates me to keep going and to not stop. So, Father, right now, we ask you for the grace to be those faithful stewards before you. And as we come before your table. Lord, help us to remember. Help us to remember, Lord, that anything that you ask us to do in money or serving or developing our gifts or taking risks, Lord, it pales in comparison to your love and what you've done for us. Lord, I pray that even in this communion moment that you would help us to remember In Jesus' name, amen.